नमस्कार वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल फ्रॉम टीम ही गुड वेरी ऑफन वी आर सो फोकस ऑन द बिग पिक्चर दैट वी फो गेट टू लुक एट द थिंग्स दैट हेल्प अस कंप्लीट द पेंटिंग इन अ कॉन्वर्सेशन विथ हिंगोरी वन डे वी रियलाइज कि कुछ ऐसी छोटी छोटी बातें हैं जो हमने अपनी स्पिरिचुअल या आध्यात्मिक मंजिल पर पहुंचने में काफी मददगार हो सकती हैं आइए आज ऐसी ही छोटी छोटी बातों पर हिंगोरी से चर्चा करें और उन्हें अपनी रोजमर्रा की जिंदगी में अपनाने की कोशिश करें अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू यू आपका बहुत बहुत स्वागत है आज का टॉपिक छोटी छोटी बातें सर कैन यू हियर मी आई कैन हियर यू अंजलि तो yeah i think the the subject uh, we chose this subject of choti choti baatein because uh, i personally remember in conversations with gurudev uh, my spiritual choti choti baatein were very enticing they were very significant to me so i thought why shouldn't we share this with everybody who's involved in some way or the other with spirituality and subjects like that so though this is just a couple of pages but it could make a lot of difference to the several pages of your life that have yet to come so uh, i've listed out a few things uh, which i i thought of and i'm sure there are so many more that you will be able to think of so uh, if you like by the time people are logging on anjali if you prefer uh, maybe i can answer some of the questions that have come to you because those yeah, will be yeah sure. in fact uh, we had put in a post requesting people to send in their questions if they'd like to answer if if i may i can start off with some of the questions here yeah but we start with this whole subject of choti choti baatein uh <laughs> have these various attributes practices realizations so then if the link is broken but i think Absolutely. lot of problem so if you like we can start even now like right so, but, but what, so some of the smaller questions right so some of the questions here the first question that was brought in by elin is uh, please do let me know how to protect myself and my family from psychic attacks evil eye and tremendous jealousy from other family members yeah okay yeah, yeah i can say okay very easily but it isn't an easy job uh, the thing is when you talk about psychic attack there are various levels of psychic attack and today if uh, supposing uh, someone person x let's say her name is R- ramana if this lady called ramana is upset with somebody in the family and she sits and curses them uh, and uh, thinks negatively about them and wishes them ill and she has a little bit of aura and power that also becomes uh, a kind of psychic attack that's the lowest level then when you come to very powerful people those are dangerous yeah. those those are very powerful people means they are, the reason why that's why you know in the olden days they used to call it shrap and uh, the people who would give the shrap would be possibly even more scared than the people who they gave the shrap to because when they gave that shrap they knew that they would lose a lot of energy and that the shrap would actually manifest and they would have hurt somebody maybe out of a, a, a momentary uh, you know emotion of anger or, or resentment or whatever so uh, that's a that's the highest level of psychic attack and then there is something called the tantra I, actually the word tantra is totally misused i would call it black magic you know the the left hand of tantra as, as some of the pseudos would like to refer to it as so these things are done you know with the you know people take away your key or they will take your clothes and they will do black magic on your clothes or they will uh, you know do black, make you drink something or eat something on which black magic has been done with negative mantras etc etc so is it easy to protect yourself no it isn't so then what do you do i have two alternatives that hit me while i am talking one of them is get somebody powerful to help you 
that person could probably help you by putting a ring around your house so that those uh, psychic attacks would possibly fail. But that ring doesn't last forever. So then the best other thing to do is to become powerful yourself. And that is what I think the whole concept of Hingori Sutras is, is how to make people more powerful within themselves so that they could you know, deflect off some of the power. But remember, uh, black magic is, is, a, uh, is a very difficult thing. Uh, just now a friend of mine who's a politician, his wife uh, is a very powerful woman. And uh, you know, she uh, politics is you know very strange business. So somebody had given her uh, you know, some packets and all that. And in one of the packets which she kept in a cupboard, she didn't look. And one day when she opened it, she saw nimbus with, you know, needles in it. And she got a shock of her life. And of course, she remembered who had given it. So then uh, she took those nimbus, etc. and threw them out of the house and uh, called me up. And it was very late in the night. And I said, listen, uh, you're a Mahagaiti Upasak. So there will be some effect. But please sit uh, in your bed for at least two to three hours. Keep a couple of glasses of water on both sides of you. And uh, sit in your bed for two to three hours. She, she's a person who's got her Mahagaitri Kasiddhi. And uh, I said, do this mantra. And uh, if you have any gel, sprinkle it all over your bed and keep drinking some. So she got very high fever. I think 104, 105, something like that. The next day, it petered off. And by the next evening, she was almost all right. And the, the day thereafter, it was as if nothing had really happened. So this is what power can do. I hope that answers the question. Right. There is another question in the audience by Farzana saying, uh, how would you know that you're a victim of psychic attack or, or is it destiny? These two things don't sort of match. So let me try and break these two sentences up into separate ones. So I'll tell you how I have noticed over the last, I mean, not only me, but all the people who do seva, uh, under the auspices of Gurudev's power, uh, we've all noticed that, you know, the, there's, they use things like you know, black, uh, black gram, that is dal, talima. They use that. Then they use, uh, you know, sometimes nimbus. Then they sometimes put drops of blood. Sometimes they, uh, you know, uh, have things uh, like tied up. Like, uh, like I remember one person who's... Uh, Thanks to whom I went to meet Gurudev, was a guy who almost died, and his brother took uh, took uh, uh, you know he took me to Gurudev, and uh, uh, the first time before I went to Gurudev, the first time I met the the brother, he was he was almost dead. I mean, only his neck could move, and the rest of his body was finished. There was no movement. Then I met him, the, the brother, the next year at the airport. He said, "My brother's fine." So that's how I went to meet uh, the gentleman who had cured him. This guy, uh, who was almost dead, had, was now on the, the door and walked me up from the ground floor to the first floor. Later on, Gurudev told them, he told them who had done this uh, black magic. And he said, look behind some of the, uh, you know, the cabinets in his bedroom. And there they found a lot of hair tied up and like that. Then sometimes you have these dolls with pins in it. And sometimes you have clothes. Like I remember a very nice boy whose, um, you know, pair of swimming trunks were stolen from CCI club. And uh, somebody did black magic on that person thing. His whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, navel down, he became paralyzed. And uh, th there are such cases that have happened. I, I, I remember 35 years ago, a milkman came to meet me. And uh, so I was wondering, why would a milkman come to meet me at 7 in the morning? And then he said that, sir, there were five drops of blood on our, uh, on our, I mean, on our door, main door. And uh, ever since then, every day, one child in our family died. Now, they were all probably staying together, 8, 10, 12 people, that five, six kids. So every day, one child would die. So the third day, when the third child uh, died, they came in to meet me. So then I, 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 I naturally beseeched Gurudev for help and uh, uh, gave them something to do. It was so long ago, I don't even remember the remedy. But after that, the two children uh, survived. And one of the children who had died entered the mother's body and spoke to me and told me how he had been uh, murdered. 
and uh, that his clothes had been left behind by the parents in the hospital and that's exactly where they were lying. He was telling us where they were lying. So the mother said, yes, yes, I think it must be there. And then they went and of course recovered the clothes. But that's technical stuff. The main thing is, uh, black magic can be a very deadly thing. I myself am a victim of black magic and I got rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, so, so this is a very common thing uh, in this I mean, I, I'm not sure it's very common everywhere in the world, but it is quite common in India. It's quite common in other countries like Bali and Africa, and South America and stuff like that, where they use these black arts you know, to hurt other people. Right. Gee. Uh, we have an audience here of about 315 people almost. So can we start off with the choti choti bate and then go back because there are a lot more questions here. Is there all which I, and I think some of them would get answered you know, in our conversation ahead. So let's start with the with the slide you have on uh, on the screen. Uh, right. So this this choti choti bate no, they had to have some structure. So it, they I think divided themselves into three structures. One is attributes, one is practices, and one is realizations. So if you look at the first slide of attributes, what I'm saying here is people, you need to learn to appreciate people and to admire people if you want their good qualities. Okay? If you, if you on the contrary, if you were to criticize them and you were to look down upon them and try to highlight or meditate on their negative qualities, then whether you make it meditate on their positive or their negative, those qualities would become attracted by you and they would be magnetically, you know, part of them would magnetically flow to you. So why not allow good qualities? And like, for example, there's a very nice, uh, you know, uh, there's a nice yogic poem which says, uh, Focus on the, if, if you want strength, focus on the elephant. If you want to be uh, daring, focus on the lion. If you want to move with speed, focus on the horse. If you want to be patient, focus on the spider. I, I'm just making up some of these animals. But I, that poem talks about several animals like this. And it talks about how you can actually uh, meditate on the qualities of that animal and acquire those qualities yourself. So that's why I, I, I believe that isn't it much more profitable, beneficial, and productive to only look at people's positive qualities? That's my submission. Second thing I, I suggest is humor. So why humor? I mean, it's not about, I mean, have you heard the joke about Ajit? Or have you heard the joke about this? Not, that's not what I'm talking about. Those are jokes. I'm talking about a humorous disposition. What does it do? I mean, I'm sure all of you know that when you're smiling and laughing, your, your mind becomes calm. And it, it totally dilutes the seriousness of the moment. And, and if you use humor effectively, it also helps you to reduce your false sense of you know, self-opinion and self-significance. So that's why my favorite line is Siti Bajaj. I don't think anybody has understood it. I'm sure some of them have. But I, I don't think people really understand what I'm trying to get at. I'm saying that if you are in a carefree mindset and you are not trying to be, uh, you know, uh, delusionally, uh, delusionally mature and you're not trying to sound profound, you know, through the spiritual vanities that you might have acquired on the way. And if you just behave kiddishly, childishly, city bajar, your mind will remain much calmer, more peaceful, and less stressed. That affects in so many ways. And I don't think we, we need an explanation for that. So I, I also believe that humor could be used at laughing at yourself. This is what I do. And this has been a magic trick for me. Because I'm making so much fun of myself, number one, I don't leave enough competition. I mean... Not many people can outdo me in making fun of myself because I have the ability to call myself anything, say anything about myself. Where others have a lot of restrictions of what they should say, what they shouldn't, how far can they go. You know what I'm saying? 
but you if you right. have a you can have great fun pulling your own leg in front of everybody what does that do it takes away the delusion of being you that the whole thing about the maya it diffuses that and you stop feeling so seriously about everything that you are and that you own and all your attachment i mean the, we can go on to a whole rhapsody of things but by and large i believe that lucky and very very lucky i mean one person who i think can do this is whose name just popped up called swati bhavan i mean i think that woman has the capability of making fun of herself maybe she doesn't maybe she's got certain restrictions in her mind but if she could go around pulling her own leg making fun of herself she would feel on top of the world and greater and larger than life my recommendation try it the other thing that is mentioned here is gratitude so you know when we talk about gratitude people always literally translate things gratitude means thank you thank you thank you that's not what i'm talking about i'm not talking about gratitude in words i'm talking about the feeling and the sense of gratitude look at it in a wider perspective if i'm gratitude for my life then you know everything that i want may not happen but i'm grateful to be alive I, i'm not sure whether that's that's something you need to be or not need to be that's a separate issue altogether but the fact that i'm grateful that i am living and i have opportunities of using my gross body for gross things in a in a world which is gross and uh, that gratitude uh, is something very few people will understand but this is an opportunity to acquire a lot in this planet and they call it the karm sthan or karm bhumi or whatever and they and, and and this is one place where you can magnetize a lot of energy if you know how to and if you have the time to but if you are busy choosing between a louis vuitton and a birkin which i think don't have a comparison then i don't think this is meant for you then i think you should focus on your brands and which car you should buy and whether it should be a something six or a seven bangle car or a five bangle car i mean they have numbers and things so then if that is your 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 scope of uh, thinking then i think then just be grateful for a nice car and waste yeah. the rest on the question of uh, on the topic of gratitude there's a question that had come in by orushikai if i may add it here yeah uh, she says in our journey of spiritual growth when we look back we have come a long way from what we were to what we are now and with immense gratitude to every form and formless who contributed in this journey there are some but there comes joy and happiness that we have improved or we are the chosen one it might be a subtle form of the ego she says how should one deal with the spiritual growth with humility very so, simple don't be stupidly humble learn to be grateful to the real person who has made this uh, transformation possible who is that anjali mm. Yes, uh, your your guru. No, oh, your energy. Mm hmm. Yourself, your destiny. Right. All our needs to be grateful to Aroshika, because we have been talking and uh, uh, when I use the word negotiation, you know, people probably think I'm talking about some business, but I think spirituality is also about negotiating other people's minds. and i have i do that for a living i do nothing else except keep on negotiating other people's mind i keep manipulating other people's minds to want to go into themselves to want to you know look at their lives and not just spend them well but to invest them well and and that's my my only uh, my only reason to want to live so aroshika if we have been able to negotiate something in your mind we could not have unless your mind and your intellect accepted it so who are you grateful to be grateful to yourself is there humility in that yes there is humility in that i mean look at the humility of i am that or i am the brahma or i am aham brahmasmi i mean is that sound does that sound very humble to you but it is ultimate humility ultimate humility is accepting of the self 
as the ultimate self. So, uh, be grateful Arushita, to Arushita that she could accept all this, she could digest all this, and she could practice all this. We spoke about the do's uh, in attributes and behaviors. And could you tell us something about the don'ts, please? Okay. Uh, Where did we speak about the do's? I don't remember having spoken about the do's. Did we? In yeah, episode? about about ah, gratitude. Okay. About yeah. So, so some of the don'ts are almost the opposite. You know, if you start criticizing people and you start looking at their negative qualities, what will happen? Exactly the opposite will happen. You'll magnetize those negative qualities. And uh, another thing about the don'ts is, I, I don't think it really fits into this, but I, I think I wasn't thinking very clearly when I made these small uh, you know, points. Uh, nazar. There's something that very few people know about. What is nazar? The eyes are, uh, I mean, the, the, I, I won't go into this very poetic uh, Shakespearean uh, uh, you know, sentence of the eyes are the windows to the soul, but the eyes are transmission agents for energy from the outside to the inside because they can magnetize that and also from the inside to the outside because they can uh, transmit energy. Uh, one of more, I mean, I, I, I've experienced this many times personally, but to give you a very historical example was this uh, lady who was the mother of the Torava, what was her name? Pitrash's wife. Not Kunti. Okay, can't remember. The mother of Duryodhan. Mm. Oh, okay. We'll have to Google that. Anyway, uh, so Anjali, who was the mother of the, the, the Kaurava family? She was a very nice woman. Gandhari says Gita. Sorry? Yeah. Gandhari says Gita. Sorry. So Gandhari had tied up her eyes for many years because she wanted to live blindly with a blind husband. And when Duryodhan was going to possibly have to face a, a more powerful soldier than Bhim, but then himself called Bhim, Gandhari called him and she opened that uh, eye mask, uh, which he had tied for so many years and all that energy had collected uh, inside her. And when she opened that, she scanned him with that, except he came with his underwear on. So that's where Bhim killed him. Otherwise, he became almost invincible because of that extra power that Gandhari put into him. Oh, I would recommend you can follow the same thing. Uh, I, I've written it somewhere else. But maybe it's not in this, uh, this set of uh, 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 points. But uh, every time you wake up in the morning, before you open your eyes and you know, start thinking of what's the time and looking at your phone, as you open your eyes, first thing you should do is cup your hands in front of your eyes and just uh, bring them together. Like they do namaz, you know, that kind of way, the way they cup their hands together. Uh, so, same way, cup your hands together and, and just keep transmitting all the energy of your eyes into, into those hands. And that energy will not be wasted uh, or uh, it will be captured by you. So, so that's, that's what Nazar uh, can do. And also, Nazar has many connotations. Like, for example, uh, when you have white products like milk, curd, etc., etc., the white catches that nazar very quickly. And it can be the nazar of a person in the house, the guy who's cooking, or it could be even a ghost or a spirit. And that, uh, that spirit's nazar also uh, can get uh, uh, captured into the white and get uh, that white uh, milk can get infected very easily. So, always put some color, you know, some haldi or some I don't know. You can you can concoct something, and uh, yep. oh, or yeah, yeah. Or cumin powder, right? Something like yeah. that. That's why you know when little babies, uh, I always tell mothers. I said, don't take your baby and make it, uh, that baby a, a showcase. You know, uh, wait till a particular period is over, and then uh, show your child to. Uh, all your friends and family. Because when people come there, they, they you know they actually magnetize away some of the uh, the good qualities of the child by by saying, "Oh, how cute, how sweet, how this." How... Eh, typical, you know. Um, I mean, some of them actually feel it also. But so I would say that this kind of a thing called nazar is something you need to understand. That is why in temples, in sthans, only those people are allowed to cook who have good thoughts. 
and whose nazar will not give you negativity in the food because food catches nazar very quick in the earlier days uh, the head of the house would possibly choose the person uh, who's who would be their cook but this is not our main subject for the day so i just wanted to mention it in passing another thing i would recommend is like don't be the snake you know we we often are envious of other people's luck and uh why be uh, someone who envies them or tries to feel bad about their success etc why be the snake in other people's life when you have the opportunity of being helpful to them and being happy for them happy is a wrong word but being uh, whatever you know grateful for their good luck etc and and that i would say is a far more productive thing not only for that person but even for your own self impression because your self impression is what is going to dis- decide uh, your status of spirituality not other people's impression only your own so would you say that com- comparing uh, your your destiny and your luck would also sort of in uh, bring in some bit of envy in it no matter how hard you try you know we we end up competing or comparing our lives with other people's lives i i i guess i must confess the only one human being i have ever met in my life who i thought was luckier than me was my guru i have not met or heard of anybody who is either alive today or was alive in the last 65 70 years who i think is worthy of envy so i don't know i don't know why uh, i i i i think we we only look at certain aspects of a person he is the richest man in the world so what look at the other issues that go with that richness so absolutely uh, treatment can't happen when you are doing a comparative study and living with the jones so if you are living with the jones like i remember one young lady who who was very fond of gurudev and vice versa she said you know i i met her at a movie hall and she was wearing these huge diamonds so i said these are real she says yeah i made my husband buy this thing i said okay so then i thought it was time to you know do a backward march and uh, she said have you bought for your wife i said no why would i so she says no no women love it. so this is the kind of you know attitude i've seen in people that their desires for showing others that they have something that others don't have or the others also have i mean i think uh, i i think that's uh, that's what brings you down in your own eyes and when i say own eyes i'm not talking about the eyes that look outward and the from the eyes that look in you so and so the self worth is based on material things is what you are saying and which which is actually a downer see that's that's the last point here anyway focus on your needs what do you mean needs what are your needs i mean roti kapda makan i understand i understand that you pay for your children's education vagaira vagaira but what is your what is the need of your being the need of your being is uh is spiritual progress there is no such thing as spiritual progress but there is no other way in english to describe it so spiritual progress is is a need and it's a dire need why is it a need because that it is because of that you took birth that's why you were, uh, you got yourself a body why not because you wanted that body to fly in a particular flight in a particular business class or a first class uh, compartment not because of that due to right. birth because it was your need to attain something to reduce some of the baggages in your mind in your in your karma or whatever so that is why one should sometimes reflect on what are one's real needs rather than the needs that one just sort of acquires out of competitiveness right so the the need i mean we need to sort of go inward to realize what our actual need is you know but what we're looking at is 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 the material existence the physical existence and the material existence that define our self opinion or our self worth 
today. Anjali, why were you born? You were you born to be, uh, you know, uh, just a nice housewife, a nice mother, a nice wife, um, a very talented, uh, creative person. Were you born for that? No. Then, now I know. No. <laughs> so if you for something, that is a need, right? I would say that is the want uh, of uh, just to exist, but that is definitely not the need. You know, the need is to evolve. Which is within, which is deeper in today. I mean, actually, Anjali, I, I don't know why people would not know this. I right. mean, know this, but I, I, at least for me, I think it's a very basic question that human beings have asked. I remember in college, uh, you know, before I had met Gurudev, I was just the usual buffoon that most people are. And, you know, we'd sit over a glass of beer and talk about our purpose of life. Which was hilarious because the conversation used to be very profound. And you know, all four or five youngsters sitting, having a, you know, a glass of beer, maybe more than a glass of beer, and talking about the purpose of life. It was ironic. But if at that age, this was a question that irked us, I guess most human beings with common intellect would ask themselves this question. Why was I born? What, are, what am I here for? And whatever the answer is, that is your need. Right. Right. Should we move so on? This, to this, yes. This leads us to the practices. How do we, how do we move towards that purpose or realization of that purpose? So, I, I, Anjali, I must confess, these notes that I've made and given you, they're not all connected to each other. It's not a flow. <laughs> That this will lead to that and that will lead to that. It, these are just choti choti baatein. For you to just do small things which have significance. Now, for example, we're talking about breath and nostril management. I would love to ask um, how many people know uh, what happens when your left nostril is breathing and what happens when your right nostril is breathing. The difference between breathing with the left or the right. I'm not going into... Uh, partly left, partly right, more left, more right, more right, more left. I'm not going to do all those combinations. There are hundreds. But I'm saying for the basic left nostril breathing, what does it, uh, uh, what does it do for you? Uh, right nostril breathing, what does it do for you? How many people have understood this? Please, uh, I don't know how you say this. Maybe you have to put up something or the other. You know, maybe those of you who have understood can put that little finger up or thumb up or something like that. Let's see how many of you know this. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, you could type in your your answers in the chat box there, and here there is Sri Devi who says that the opposite brain gets activated. But yeah. that that's more of her scientific answer. Yes. No, no, scientific. And, about, it, 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 it's the physical, it's the physiological answer. Physiological aspect. Then Ritu Tandon says that I think breathing through left nostril relaxes us and breathing through the right nostril energizes us. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And there are lots of thumbs up here. So yes, uh, left cools, right warms is what Priya Mehta says. Yes, I, can, I, I think she's 100% right. So I guess I'm talking to a very intelligent audience. And why the hell am I talking? You already know all these things. So there is some Priya Vakil who says about left nostril. Yes, I knew, but did not know about the right one. Good. I can score one point at least. <laughs> <laughs> Priya, the thing is, the right nostril is the right nostril to, I mean, is the correct nostril to be breathing through when you want to go and play a game of football or even if you're going for, uh, you know, if you're walking out of the house, people normally consider the right foot to be more auspicious. I don't know why. I, I don't think so. But uh, so uh, the right nostril also connects to the left brain. And um, that's the more dynamic and energized brain. And the right nostril is an energy outward movement. The left nostril is an energy inward movement. You're far more magnetic when your left nostril is breathing. And I, mean, I don't think it has anything to do with calmness of the mind. But I think it's the whole configuration of the right side of the brain. It's more creative, it's more magnetic, and uh, it's far more uh, calming and, and, and absorbing 
for example if you want to study i tell a lot of kids i said you know take this little ball put it under your right armpit uh and squeeze it for 3 minutes and after that you'll find your left nostril is breathing keep that a ball there for an hour or two and you'll be able to absorb a lot more so this is how uh, swar yoga works and, and and also you know i found i've done this research for last 30 35 years a lot of people you know they sleep on one side mainly on one side so if they're sleeping with their left nostril upwards which is on the right side of their body is down and the left nostril is upstairs they will have a far more calming uh you know uh, this position those who uh, uh, sleep with their right nostril that will be little more hyper so these are things you need to work out yourself these are the principles see how they work for you right what is it yeah there's a question here if i may add in but uh, after letting go of a lot of envy i got in touch with deeper emotions of anger frustration self importance pride uh, realization during meditation this in brackets to work on see i'm struggling with the beliefs that i am unable to work under pressure and can't market myself a um, most difficult struggle is my inner core or spirit's unhappiness that i was not able to follow your instructions to the t so i think one quick confession will solve her problem Does she right. able to follow my own instructions to the T? If she does mm-hmm. things, then she needs to get her alphabet right. It is never possible to be able to be perfect. So don't look for that. If you've been able to go from X to Y, or from A to M, or whatever, I think you've done very well. And remember, the moment you have put into into motion those intentions and ambitions of 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 becoming a better human being i'm i'm assuming that's what the question was right anjali yes it is i think is a lot to do with uh, 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 pent up emotions that are stuck and and brought in that negativity within so the, the emotions are coming out in forms of anger and frustration oh okay like that right yeah So I think sometimes you know uh, physical exercise helps. I think what I used to do when I was a kid, uh, when I was about eighteen, twenty, nineteen, seventeen, eighteen—I don't remember now—16, 17, 18 years old. Uh, we used to live near the sea, and uh, uh, and at that time the seaside wasn't crowded with a million people. Uh, you'd hardly see a car there. I'm talking about fifty, sixty years ago, fifty years ago. So. i would uh, walk up to uh, the seaside and i would go and sit on the rocks by myself and i would look at the sea and at that time i didn't know that uh, the, the 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 deity of the sea is my grandmother i just looked at it as water body okay uh, and uh, i looked at that sea as my water body and i actually spoke to the sea and i actually screamed and said this took out my frustration there and i used to wonder how the hell this works i never realized that water could actually take away those those uh, those things so here is a uh, here is something that i never learned nobody taught me it was just something that happened accidentally and today there's a lot of research on this especially in japan about how if you give bad words to the water the crystals will change if you show love to the water the crystals will change so i am assuming i had a lot of water at the sea the whole sea would would you know would have to take my emotions and and somehow i would feel relieved after 15 20 30 minutes or whatever so there is a way to take away your frustration and also you can do it at the gym you can go it while going for a run or a walk the whole concept is do not allow the mind to continuously replay 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 those emotions that's the catch right right so i mean so that is uh, one way of cleansing your energy or 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 conserving your energy i would say so there are rid of your emotions is what i was talking about right right, right. so uh, i mean uh, when we do get rid of our emotions or control our emotions 
in a way we are conserving our aura right or from getting and the uh, problem you are thinking about your emotions na absolutely with anger and uh, gurudev told me how he had to, i couldn't do that you know i wasn't working in an office where i could sit and do the kind of things he used to do so i used to keep wondering what should i do then one day a thought hit me okay let it be i mean, i'm not referring to a beatles song called let it be but i'm just saying that uh, the words let it be hit me and i said fine i don't care i'll get angry let the anger come so you it was unbelievable i, I don't think it is believable for any of my, our listeners here to even believe what i'm saying but i would allow that anger to come and go and i wasn't trying to restrict my emotions i had an intention that i don't want to be emotional and i must control but i would do nothing to control and slowly automatically things sorted themselves out it was my not doing rather than my doing that work much more but that's a separate subject for a day the not doing concept right sir so if we can move on to the energy mag- management as about uh, i mean we've spoken a lot about aura in our previous talks but we've never really spoken about certain small small choti choti practices you know, that could help for example you always spoke about nails and hair when you cut them that you must respectfully immerse them in the river if you could tell us a bit about that too so your nails and your hair they control uh, they 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 are i wouldn't use the word infected but i don't know any other word they are uh, your aura manifests in them that's a better way to put it so your aura manifests in these and you go to the barber shop you have your hair cut the barber takes it with a jhadu and then he takes that hair and ma- mixes it with so many other people's hair it's like having your aura mixed with so many other people's aura and then that barber sells it to somebody god knows for what or throws it in the gutter so basically a part of you is going guttering every 2 3 months when you go for a hair cut and same thing with your nails i asked so many people what do you do they said we put it in the flush and we flush it down i said wonderful when was the last time you flushed yourself da i don't think there was an answer coming but that's exactly what you're doing you're taking your nails and you're putting it down a flush and you're making it you know mixing it with all the the muck that you can and uh, that's the respect you're showing yourself so i'm saying why can't we respect ourselves even at the level of our aura which is contained in all these things why can't we put them in the river or the sea or if nothing else bury it in the land if there is no river or sea near you you can wait i sometimes wait for years before i do these things and i do it at one time i'm sure there are ways you can find of being able to show your self respect by not taking parts of you and you know uh, sort of uh, discarding them in such terrific manners same way you know when um, uh, this happened to me uh, I mean, this has happened to me many times. Like when you're lying down, somebody walks over you. If you have a large enough aura, you will feel that uh, that energy. Have any uh, Have any of you ever felt it? Somebody walks over you while you're lying down. You feel that that there is a cut happening uh, at at a foot higher than your legs, and uh, or six inches, eight inches higher. And people aren't cultured enough to know these things. So if they're not cultured, they won't even know that they're walking over you and they're. actually affecting you people walk over dogs walk over they, they maybe the dogs don't have that great an aura but if it is a powerful person if it has that person has a you know fairly good radiation of aura then every time you walk over that person you actually cutting that person's aura and it happened to me uh, in an out of the body experience when i went through the fan to a room higher than the one in which i was sleeping and when i came back so i went through the fan i was quite uh, amazed by the fact that uh, my uh, spirit body could actually fly through a fan but when i came down i stood still with my head downwards and my a little above my ankles were stuck in the uh, the the place where the fl- uh, the fan blades were moving and i heard a sound crack and the next 15 days i was limping okay 
because my leg was hurt in the exact same space. So I've actually experienced this at a much higher level. But this can happen to all of you. I'm not saying it's an outer body experience, but when people walk all over you or walk across you, make sure you don't allow them to do that. While we're on this topic of aura, if I can could go back to the nails and hair bit, there's a question here in the audience by Aishwarya asking that so many people stand or play in the water when we immerse, when we immerse our hair and nails. Doesn't the aura of each other then get mixed there? Yes. I never go swimming. I love swimming. I used to love swimming, but I just think about the qualities I'll pick up in the water. So I don't want those qualities. And therefore, but I'm not saying that you, I don't, everybody doesn't have to think like that. You don't have to think like me. I don't have to think like you. But these are my, uh, you know, phobias or I don't know what is the word to use. But yes, when you're swimming, uh, the water has already captured the aura of many people. And uh, I don't know, unless you go, and, like for example, the Ganga. Okay, there is a place which I have not seen physically, but there is a place where the Ganga goes under the mountains in a kind of a tunnel, and that's called the Gupta Ganga. That is where a lot of deities also come and immerse themselves in that, and that is why the Ganga's water is so rich in uh, in in its energy that it lasts much longer and it is used for auspicious reasons. Similarly, when you go into a I mean, if you go into one of these very famous clubs of Mumbai or Delhi, enjoy. Pick up the aura of all the richy riches and all the who who was and all that, those kind of characters. And you probably have some of those qualities acquired by you. I'm when sorry, we talk I... about qualities, you hear uh, Sri Devi says that Keralites' babies are made to walk under an elephant to get the courage and strength of the elephant. Absolutely. But uh, Keralites probably don't know that they should throw water on the elephant which should fall on the baby. Right. They should actually throw water on the elephant and when that water slides down the elephant, the baby's uh, body should be put... Uh, uh, you know, there are certain children born spastic. Now, I don't know where uh, these, these uh, today you don't get these animals, but um, uh, there's something called a bear, reach, they call it in Hindi. At one time, these reach were captured by, you know, trainers and they would make them do some dance et cetera, on the beaches. And, and uh, uh, Gurudev had told me that I, I, I had a son who had, a, you know, a problem with his uh, feet and uh, he had a, a certain amount of cerebral palsy. So he told me to, you know, um, uh, you know, throw water over a reach and put this child under that and let that aura of that reach, you know, uh, come and um, sort of uh, get mingled with this child's legs. So uh, the Keralites who, who do this, they know their stuff. Maybe they, they forgot that you do have to throw water also. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, so Priya Vakil here asked the question. So, uh, when we go to get haircuts, we should collect our hair and immerse it in water. Yes, and not only that, Priya, please come and have a haircut in my house. I will create a room for all of you to come and have a haircut. Because <laughs> when your hair falls onto the floor, there's an earthing of that aura. So, if you have to go to have your hair cut, put a newspaper under where you said, look foolish. Uh, let them think you're an idiot. But it's better to be thought of as an idiot than to be one. And uh, collect that hair on that newspaper, wrap it up, and then immerse it in the water. But if you don't do that, then you let that hair fall on the floor. A lot of that energy, that is the loose energy that the hair is carrying, will get energized into the floor. So it gets absorbed in the floor, is it? So then you've lost the... So then Some, picking up the hair from the floor is of no use then because the, en the energy is already absorbed and earthed into the... Newspaper, it's floor. a bad color. Right. Absolutely.
another thing that i wanted people to know about this has bothered me a lot people in the western world have no sense of hygiene and um, you know if you offer them something they'll take a sip out of it they'll not take the spoon and have it and then keep the spoon away they put the spoon back in the bottle and that becomes jhuta and i have lived i i studied in a boarding school so you know there were about so many years of my life and all our lives who were there we used to drink each other's uh, jhuta but fortunately the guys out there were not so bad but jhuta can be very very dangerous number 1 it carries quality so if you are having the jhuta of somebody who is highly evolved you are very lucky to have that but if it is somebody who is not evolved and you are very unlucky to have that and sometimes uh, even diseases of some people you know especially infections of of spirit infections those can get and i have seen this happen and i've seen it happen in front of my eyes you know when uh, a lady was warned not to have a daughter's uh, jhuta she didn't listen and slowly that the mother also got infected so these are some of the things that i would recommend you 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 can avoid doing right ji the other thing uh, yes men's periods right so people look down at women and they actually what they don't realize is that scientifically it has been tested that during that cycle a woman's energy levels rise much higher and they've tested it in saline liquids and that kind of thing the only thing is uh, what they could not understand in the test is that a woman's uh, energy levels rise tremendously but it is more tamasic so that is why uh, not that is why 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 they are uh, stop from going to temple because the temple priests are scared that the woman might magnetize that energy okay for some of it which happens so um, so therefore magnetize that energy because they are uh, more powerful during that period uh, that time is it the time of the month and and so uh i feel that uh, you know i i look at it exactly the opposite way but the result is the same i feel that clashes with the you know going to a temple when you are having this period why to go into the clashes you know because that energy also feels threatened it also feels uh sort of kind of attack or whatever I mean, I, I mean, you can find your own adjective so i would recommend that in such days one can avoid uh, going to a temple but go and give everybody a hug in all your social parties and get richer same thing with shaking hands like you know i would suggest that uh, hugging and sh- shaking hands with powerful people is a loss making business and i think uh, one of the questions that you sent me were that uh, people said uh, someone said that um, is it a good idea or bad idea for me to go to the temple so i'm answering that question now you see right. there is a double edged sword if you are going to the temple to beg for something and ask for something then you will leave some energy behind uh, but if you go into the temple uh, you know to appease that power of the temple and say i have come here because i think you are a great power and i think coming and showing you my respect is my honor and i want nothing i just want to wish that you are i, I just want to wish you well Now that first of all one out of a million will come in with that thought process correct right and if they had to have that thought process they'll say mandir kyu jana ji so <laughs> if you have thought process and if you can look at going to these powerful places more as an appeasement to the power there then there is no loss there is alignment right another thing that uh, i think the last point here is uh, consuming alcohol see you know there's nothing there's no sin in alcohol you know everybody thinks ke paap hai pun hai ye hai wo hai the whole thing is alcohol is a downer it brings your kundalini down to lower chakras your mooladhara chakra gets very thrilled when you have alcohol because your uh, your kundalini gets stuck there much more deeply i mean much more magnetically or whatever so uh, here you are doing mantra vidya to raise your uh, your energy levels 
and there you are consuming alcohol to lower them, it becomes like a seesaw and therefore very unproductive. And that's why we don't give mantras very easily to people unless they're willing to, uh, you know, sacrifice having alcohol. Other things are not so not so negative. Like for example, I, I don't know what is, uh, you know, ganja. I, I, I don't know what plant it is and all that kind of thing. No. I don't but uh, there are some of these, uh, you know, these things that these sadhus have in these chillums and things, uh, which are not down, they are uppers. But I don't recommend them either. But uh, yeah, if somebody was to have that in limited amount, that, that would not hurt them in terms of, you know, bringing their kundalini down. I'm just making a statement. I'm not recommending anything. Right. You've also said that... Uh... While we're talking, we're on the subject of aura that, you know, you shake hands or you hug a powerful people hmm, is not a good idea. See, this Gunwant Agarwal has probably gone to an English literature class and come up with a word that I don't understand. Why is promiscuity? What the hell does this mean? Hmm. Anjali? Uh, G. What is uh, the word? Word promiscuity. Uh, uh, sexuality. Overtly oh. sexuality. Spiritually very harmful. Nice of you to teach us a phenomenally impressive word, Gunwan. Uh, why is it spiritually harmful? Who said that? I mean, who said it's harmful? I mean, there's a guy called Acharya Rajneesh who became Osho and all that kind of thing. See, whatever you might think about him or say about him, some of the fundas that this guy used to come up with were very realistic fundas. Okay? He, was, he was a practitioner of Tantra and uh, he had done a couple of Siddhis. Uh, so he wasn't just a talker. And I believe he wrote a book called uh, Sex to uh, Superconsciousness or something like that. And, and that, is, that is actually uh, what marriage is. When we come to marriage, we'll talk about that. Oh, Bhutan says promiscuity means illicit relationships. Yeah. We'll come to that. Okay. What else, Anjali? Right. So, while, uh, so when we speak about, uh, yes, yeah, so if we could go on to the do's of the aura as to how do we manage our auras, uh, you know, for example, how do you neutralize the external energies? Particularly, Anjali, it's about North Pole, South Pole attraction. Okay. If you studied physics, you have seen that a magnet cannot attract. The, if you put the magnet in such a way that the North Pole faces the North and the South faces the South, it will, it will throw itself away from each other. It will not get attached to each other, not get attracted to each other. So, if you look at a deity or you look at a powerful being or you look at a guru, or you look at a Bhagwan. I mean, there is no such thing as Bhagwan, but these guys who are considered Bhagwan, you know, maybe these very powerful forces, etc. Always look at them from the from the south to the north. Even if you go to a temple or a church, don't just go and clash your north pole with their north pole. Right. Look at the south pole and then slowly go up and look at the north. That is one of the ways to neutralize energies. Then, uh, and also to avoid clashes. Appeasement of energies. Now, see, when we were talking about uh, temples, I think uh, Mr. Agarwal came up with the idea about, uh, at least one of the questions that I think he had sent in the morning was about temples, right? So, yes. I have this question that if you're going to a temple uh, in order to appease that temple and to do a havan there, or to do a whatever langar there, and you're doing something which is in the, I mean, what is the English word for mandir ki shan mein? How do you how do you say that in English? Mm. Can't say pride. Mm. I mean, if you're doing something which is uh, which is the benefit to that temple, then this becomes a form of appeasement. Then the temple also, is there. and then if you go and say that you give me a this and that and that, then then you screwed it up. You know what I'm saying? But if you go to a temple and you uh, go there not for anything, just to show appreciation and uh, 
and maybe you do a havan there or whatever, get it done there and distribute uh, uh, you know th things to all the people around, whatever. Then there is that. Then that is not a, a negative quality. That's a good do. Right. Then we talked about Diwali the other. That's uh, too much right now. We can we can talk about it some other time. But uh, you know, so so some of the things that uh, I've seen work are uh, the, the the crossings. You know, crossings are very powerful places. That is why a lot of black magic, these utaras. You know, they take out negative energy, then they go and leave it at the crossing because the energy at the crossing is powerful enough to hold that in suspension. So every time you're driving past a crossing and there's something like a wrapped in a red cloth or a black cloth or a nariel or this, that and the other lying in the middle of the road, please go around it and don't just drive over it. Many people have got these negative energies that they have caught doing such things. Right. Uh, and uh, there was some uh, so there was something that you spoke about also about the uh, home tantric cure of charahe ki mitti you know there was a lady who used to work in our house she come from a nearby village I think my daughter my wife's daughter more than mine uh, <laughs> um, sort of uh, I don't know what was happening to herself. She was unwell. So she says, uh, Me, karun, uh, dena. So my wife said, How? So she took some four or five tea leaves out of a jhadu. Then she took some matti from the choraya. Then she took some red chilies. I think she also took some salt. And she did that stuff, you know, around her face and around her body. Then she went and burnt that red chili, and that red chili either had no smell or had smell, whatever. Whatever doesn't happen, happened. And uh, and the the young girl, the young baby, I think within the next day or so started getting much better and stuff like that. So I've seen these things work at Chorayas. I, uh, I also realized why the Chorayas is uh, significantly powerful is because of the crisscrossing of the tails of aura that happened there. Energies cross each other. And when they cross each other, they, they get sort of, uh, what is the word? I don't know. Uh, they, they, they sort of, uh, you know, there's a word I can't get. And then they just start, drop to the ground and then they all amalgamate like mercury and uh, become, the Charaya becomes a powerful place. Right. right. We all talk about this cupping of hands, so I don't think we should repeat that. Meditation in charged locations like gyms. See, there are certain places which are powerful. Like Chorayas are powerful, but you can't go and sit on a Chorayas and do meditation. They probably, you know, send the municipal corporation after you. But um, uh, like gym, now you can't go to a gym and say, I'm doing meditation there. But you can do your parts there, your mantra there. So you will, the mantra will automatically attract some energy, which is anyway going to get clean. The energy is only going to be swept away the next morning anyway. And um, cow sheds, forests, these are places where a lot of aura, is just lying around. So while you're doing your part and your feet are on the ground and earth, there is an opportunity to pick up a lot of energy that you can hold. Most of the energy that you can pick up will not be holdable by you because your kundalini's ability to rise creates the capacity for you to hold energy. It's like an inverted triangle. So the higher you rise in your in your uh, gravity of uh, spiritual gravity, uh, the higher you can rise, the more energy you can hold. Otherwise, you can pick up energy, but it will just not stay with you because you don't have the holding capacity and the magnetic quality. Right. And you, you spoke about mantras. Uh, you, know, you spoke about practicing mantras at home to create the energy bank or like you said, that if you do your mantra with there at gyms and cow sheds. But there is one problem here. We've got two questions here about mantras. Saying that, uh, you know, you had said the mantra vidya to protect one from nazar, but sometimes uh, I lose concentration or get bored while reciting long mantras. And another question that's come in says that I'm unable to 
say my mantra more than three to four times at a stretch, after which I get distracted by a frenzy of thoughts racing across my mind. I have to force my mind to focus over and over, but my thoughts are constantly scattered. So how do we work around that? It's a very interesting question, Anjali. Uh, two, three suggestions. One is, when you're doing Mantra Vidya, focus on the words of the mantra. Focus that you're getting them right. Do it at a speed, as, as fast as you can. Because that takes your mind, the three attentions that the, that the human mind has, right? Yes. One of those attentions will be totally captured by that, by that mantra. And that's good enough. Now, if you were to add focus on the words of that mantra and you were to say it like that, like for example, Om by the time I finish saying that Prachodaya, you know, I needed to have my own entire focus on it. I, I, otherwise, how would I say those words? So I have to speak the mantra fast enough so that my attention is required to be able to pronounce the words correctly. That is one way I can focus on the mantra. Second thing is that when mantra gets into my system, it may take six months, one year, two years, three months, one month. Then even while I'm walking around, it's about practice and rehearsal. Every time I'm walking around, that mantra will continue to go up. The so initially, I have to put in a lot of energy and burst into it. And later on, it becomes automatic transmission. And I should sit for one, one hour every night, half an hour. Now I can say 10 minutes for all I care. But uh, I mean, if you ask me, you should sit for an hour and a half every night, for two hours. And keep doing your part. And focusing on the breath and focusing on the mantra. And then just knock off to sleep. Your thoughts will come. They will, uh, it's called uh, a very nice yogic term for this. Anyway, I can't remember. So, uh, th these things will come up, you know, from that that little, that little energy ball called kar karmashe. Or it will, it will keep discharging all kinds of thoughts and, uh, you know, um, argumentative thoughts and stuff like that. So, don't, don't focus on that. Let it come. It is discharging. So something is getting reduced. And what is getting reduced is the negative. So let it get reduced. And at some point of time, X, you'll be able to be far more accomplished in one Right. right. And before we move, uh, 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 move on to the next topic and move away from Aura, there's a question here which uh, uh, Kalpana asks, is there something called a bad aura as well, as there, there is a discussion on protecting and managing good aura, auras. So, uh, how do we identify the difference between bad aura and good aura? Actually, um, it is not a good aura or a bad aura. I don't know whether we can really qualify it like that, but um, aura takes on different colors. And um, you know, certain colors will create uh, a kind of a, you know, trends and feelings of negativity. Then certain auras are, uh, are infected with planetary uh, configurations of rays and chemistries, which for you might be negative, but for me, they may not or vice versa. So I would not, uh, I would not, uh, I would not qualify aura as good or bad. Uh, one question from Gita Soni is, please suggest how to hold our aura while crossing Chauraha. You don't hold your aura, Gita. You, uh, you don't cross over that, that thing lying in the middle of the Chauraha. And if you're crossing over a Chauraha, slow down and keep saying your part while you're crossing it. Walk across it. You will pick up energy. Right. So, so Neil Dalal asked the next question. Will it help? If we do mantra vidya while we're swimming. <laughs> yeah, Neil, you can capture a lot of negative qualities. I know the club you go to swim. My God, why do you want to have those qualities? I can't understand. So I suggest you don't do vidya while you're swimming. Because you would also discharge some of your aura in the water. Yeah. Then uh, Tara would like to know, can one do their mantra in a place like a hospital or a crematorium or an orphanage and dedicate the merit 
to the well-being of the patients, the dead spirits or children. Very nice thought. Very scoring thought. I mean, uh, if nothing else, your spirit within will really admire you for this Tara. And that's the whole game. You need to convince your inner self. I mean, many, many cells are there inside you. But that innermost self, the, the day you can convince your innermost self that you've arrived into the league that that inner self would expect you to be in, spiritually you have advanced. You may not have done even a single mantra. You may not have fed a single person. It, the, whole, the whole game is about psyching the self. And these things psych the self. Right. So there was another question here at this point. Uh, we did speak about women and there was a question that came in earlier today saying that during the Shakti period, we are not allowed to do part of Maha Mrithanjay and Raksha Mantra. Uh, here I have a part that one way is a simran. Hai. So, हम उनका सिमरन क्यों नहीं कर सकते? नहीं कर सकते, कर सकते। But it's like putting on a switch of a light fused. What will you do with that switch? And most people think that mantra vidya is very dharmic. I can't see any dharma in mantra vidya. These are all acupressures of the soul, not soul but the spirit body. You know, it, it activates certain uh, things. It it uh, configure it. It configures certain uh, what's the word? Uh, the Western world is very affirmations. It, it configures so many affirmations. And can you imagine saying a mantra one crore times? That same affirmation one crore times completely uh, hypnotizes your mind to believe in it. So, what is the point of keeping on putting on a switch which is not at that time? Mahamantanji and, and Raksha Mantra are both Shiv Mantras and they're inactive. So, you can, uh, so if, you, if you're looking at it as a very dharmic kind of view, then, then you can do it. Nothing's going to go wrong in your life. But why not do something which is more productive? Unless you want to do it as a Simran, then do it. But there is no Simran in Mantra. I mean, there is Simran. When you talk about certain deities, you know, like you say, Lach Mahalakshmi Namo Vijay, Padmavati Devi Namo Vijay, whatever it is. I mean, Chamunda Devi Namo Vijay. So there is a there is an attribute to that Chamunda Devi. You're you're actually enlivening that Chamunda Devi element within you. Again, I don't think that deity called Chamunda Devi is waiting out there and saying, "Okay, this guy is doing my mantra, so I think I need to pay him a visit." It doesn't work like that. Right. Right. Gee, thank you. There is one, uh, you know, we just spoke about, about uh, the mantras and being able to silence the thoughts. So while we're on the subject of silencing, the, I'd like to go back to that. There's a question by Pooja saying that silence is magical. This I realized only when I stayed in silence during COVID. But what really followed was that in that silence, I could communicate with people without actually talking. I could read people's mind. How can I enhance this quality? It does not happen so easily anymore. You know. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not saying pray for COVID again. But, but uh, uh, who who is this person asking this question? Puja. Uh, so Puja, I would only suggest that if you were see already. Certain uh, plumbing works have happened in, in, inside you, which is why intuitiveness has got triggered off. But then after COVID, you must have started going and doing the same thing that you, you were doing. You might have lost that silence. You must have lost that boredom. And most people think boredom is boring. But boredom is bliss. And I don't think any of you are going to believe what I'm saying. Because unless you experience it, how will you know? You know what I'm saying? To me, boredom is the greatest aspiration of my life. Because that's one place where I'm neither up nor down. Nor, uh, I'm in non-duality as a state. So, if you uh, have started going uh, uh, you know, back to your normal self, then you'll lose that uh, intuitiveness. So, go back to 
uh, what was happening to you during COVID. Say a lot of your parts. Spend some time gazing into nothing. All these kind of things. Right. We had spoken about barkat. Barkat is a word which is very misunderstood most of the time because it's understood as material wealth in abundance. So could you oh. please explain barkat to us? So, Anjali, let me ask you a question. Jay? Let's say you spend one lakh rupees a month on your house. I mean, you may spend more or less, it doesn't matter. Right. You earn one and a half lakhs of rupees a month, whether it's you, your husband, your daughter, whoever. Yes. One lakh. I'm just giving you a hypothetical example. Yes. Be as rich as the amount you can spend. Right. What excess of that you have? How are you? How is that your money? You'll never be able to spend it, so it's not yours. Absolutely. So, barkat means not about having a lot of money or not about not having a lot of money. It's just that your money lasts you as much as you need it and want it. That is barkat. Okay. Supposing a maid is earning fifteen thousand rupees a month, let's say. Right. And her family is well. They're all used to living, um, you know, in very frugal lives. The husband also earns 15,000. Wife also earns. They spend about seven, 8,000 on their food. They spend about four, 5,000 on their children's education. So they're, they're still saving 10,000 a month. And they don't know what to do with that 10,000. That's barkat. One of the okay. richest of this country, uh, he may have several thousand crores, but he may not be able to repay his debts. That's not barkat. Right. So, barkat uh, in the spiritual context, what does that mean? Yeah. I've never heard this question before, so let me think. What would barkat mean in a spiritual context? Gee. It means possibly, you know, you have to change the currency from money to cosmic currency. You have more power than you need. You have more power than you can use. Your aura is far, uh, lo uh, you know, wider than, than, uh, than, you, uh, than, you, than you know what to do with it. That is barkat. Gee. One of the things that I have made a note of, I don't know whether it's there, when you give away, right? Yes. So, every gift you give carries the guna of that gift with it. So, if you are, so, so what do people do? On Saturdays and things like that, they give away, uh, you know, base metals. Iron. Like iron, mm. copper, and things like that. The tamsic metal. So, that takes yeah. away your, to mm. some extent. Uh, people like, uh, I mean, not people like me, I, in, in my initial years, you know, when I learned these choti choti baate, I, I stopped giving silver coins on Diwali to anybody. I said, why the hell am I giving away my good qualities? Right? Yeah. Until Barkat happened. And then when Barkat happened, now every year we sit down and we, we gift so many, many silver coins uh, to people who can't afford them or who forget them and and uh, also others who bring silver coin, we touch that silver coin into our aura and, uh, you know, bless that silver. What do you mean bless? There's no such thing as bless. These are only words. It's actually a technical thing. You're putting your aura on that silver coin and giving it to that person, right? Right. It will carry that, uh, that quality of silver from you to that person. So this is what, uh, why I have put this point down. Uh, so, I remember there was a guy who was an alcoholic. Gurudev made him give away, uh, I don't know, 150 or 300 bottles of scotch whiskey. His friends loved him after that. But this guy, could, <laughs> you know, he, his alcoholism sort of... Uh, so, I'm just giving you this information. Now, I'm not saying what you should do with it. If you know this, you can use it somewhere, somehow. Right. So, I mean, we say that we don't give money on to people on Thursdays. 
but uh, there has a question by Preeti asking that can we then give uh, food instead on Thursdays? I, I would only tell one thing to Preeti. Look, if you if you have enough barka, then you give away your money. Give it away, na. I mean, I'm not saying this because one of our Thursday restrictions. But let me put it this way: I can't tell you to defy what what has been um, determined. But I personally don't think twice about giving a tip on a Thursday. I don't think twice about giving some people money on a Thursday. I think uh, I think the universe has uh, been kind enough to provide me more than I need. Okay. So I, I would think one should look at everything in 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 its uh, in its relative perspective. So a way to look at it is that uh, barkat is also not ours to own, right? So so why not share it? Yeah. What do you think we do on uh, what is that function called? Dhanteras. Dhanteras. We give away. Uh, we give money away. I mean, right. give money away. But we take either five rupee notes or ten rupee notes, bless it, and give it to somebody. So what are we actually giving them? We are giving them our barkat. Right. And the moment you know you are capable to think like that, then that giving away the barkat actually becomes acquiring it at a much larger scale. Mm. But th these are the uh, you know paradoxes. Gee. Can I go through the other points quickly? Because otherwise yes. We... yes, please do. We, we were talking about barkat. I mean, Preeti brought up food. Yeah. So, uh, how does keeping fast help in several ways? So, you know, um, this Monday fast, for example, is about Shiv. They say Shivji ka brata. What does that mean? It means uh, uh, I have kept a fast so Shivji will be happy. I mean that I I think that's uh, it's as ridiculous as uh, Ringa Ringa Roses is as a spiritual sentence. How how can any uh, you know how can any manifestive power be happy because you didn't eat on that day? It doesn't make any sense, but it does. What does it What does it mean? It means the Shiv Tattva rests in the area of the third eye, pituitary, whatever your penal gland, whatever gland it's called, and. Because there is not much of activity of eating and digestion and secretion, that calmness in that area. So if you keep a Monday fast, you will find that you're much calmer. If you keep a Shivratri breath or a Ganesha, you find yourself much calmer on that day. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. So that is why it's called a Monday fast. It's called a Shivji ka breath. It's not, nothing to do with Shivji. It has to do with the Shiv Tattva within you. Right. Thursday fasts are kept because people don't easily find a guru. If you're listening to someone on a microphone, uh, on a video, that's not a guru. He might be a guru, but at that moment, he's just a uh, speech maker for you. He's not going to take over your responsibility. He can teach you many things, but he's not going to take over your responsibility of your mentorship. So, uh, people want that. People are desperate to get the a Siddh Guru. The guy who doesn't take more than two crores or rupees a year and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I get a modern day description of a Siddh Guru. But, uh, but uh, for that, people don't know how to find a Guru. So what do they do? They keep Thursday fast. And because it's the day of Jupiter and they only have this yellow stuff and uh, no salt, no cereal, uh, and only they drink yellow things or eat yellow things, uh, that breath sometimes over maybe 16 times or whatever, or 20 times or whatever, that breath can have the impact of coincidentally helping you to find someone who is a spiritual mentor. Then comes ancestral deaths. So, okay. you know, most of our ancestors weren't exactly very intelligent people. Nobody taught them what to do. So then what happened? So they didn't do anything much for themselves. So they said, we have made a house, we have made our children, we have helped our children to get well educated. Okay, that's great. You did all your personal agenda and your duties. 
but they did not do anything that would evolve them to a point where the self within them could say that yes you have done great work on this earth they haven't so they suffer their unconscious mind will not allow them peace and so we need to do things in their name and in their favor so that they can get some benefit out of it and also sometimes these ancestors can be very unfair then they had the time to do something they didn't do it and then they would expect their descendants to do it for them i don't see the fairness in that but then who the hell said everybody's fair and then that's that's what leads to pitra pida and the ire of the ancestor so do whatever has to be done on the days of the shraddh etc appeasement for the ancestors is a good productive thing and you can do anything you can feed people in their name and plant trees in their names read a book called karma sutra it will tell you what to do do it now we come to a subject called realization vanditi right so i just pen down a few things that i felt people should realize one of them is marriage it's an institution that can hardly work hardly work what <laughs> around you how many people do you know who are happily married happily is another stupid word how many uh, do you know who are married to contentment hmm. do you know even hmm. one <laughs> nobody exactly <laughs> so marriage is an institution that can hardly work but people don't understand it people think about marriage as uh, you know uh, boy meets girl romance happens infatuation happens sensuality happens that's not marriage that's animal instinct i'm not saying that i wasn't subject to animal instinct so i'm not looking down at anybody i had lots of animal instinct uh but then sometimes you can grow up and not be an animal also right so i think marriage should be understood as a concept it is a union it is uh, the deficiencies of one form being fulfilled by the efficiencies of another form and that to me is marriage a man can give a woman through marriage and intimacy that tatva of shiv remember that's where uh, the burst happens when uh, a person uh what is the word for it ejaculates right right ejaculate doesn't happen where it happens it happens in the head right and that is what is that power that a woman acquires from a man but that man also has the right to acquire shakti from a woman which he doesn't do because he is more interested in in the you know uh, entertainment of the whole uh, matter so there is a lot of energy exchange that can happen and that's what marriage is meant to give you know the the efficiencies to replace the deficiencies mm mm-hmm. another thing about marriage is you know people are so dumb uh, i admire the muslims in fact uh, uh, if any uh, my wife has two sons if any of them get married i'm going to give meher <laughs> i think what a way to cancel the uh the liability of kanyadan one of the greatest uh, liabilities that, that any family uh, accrues when they take somebody's hand in marriage for their sons so kanyadan is a killer and so is dowry mm-hmm. and so i feel you should take I mean, why can't you learn something from the, the the faith of the Christianity? Why can't you learn something from the faith of uh, uh, the Islamic uh, communities, from the Hindu communities, from Buddhism? You have to learn to use the right techniques, the best techniques, the best practices of every religion. And to me, meher is most brilliant practice of Islam. There is no kanya left after that because you paid for everything.
could you expand uh, this as to how is a dowry and how is the uh, the husband and his family indebted to the family of the of the girl that they bring into the family try to waste time on such con- a conversation i mean you take something from somebody if somebody gives you a gaay ka daan that's a gaay daan right right somebody gives you their daughter it's a kanya daan they have fed bathed educated that girl who is supposed to be part of your family for 15 20 25 years well, how are you going to repay that you can't repay that but coming to a uh, slightly more serious stuff about marriage see uh, marriage i'm going to teach something which possibly most people don't know the left side and the right side of each human being is also the shiv and shakti side correct correct so the marriage of shiv and shakti the union of shiv and shakti happens within a person also yes so if you were to so there are a lot of mudras which uh, which are meant to offer that intimacy between the right side of a human being and the left side of a human being but i'm saying getting all this will get very complicated so just allow the right side of you and the left side of you to love each other I mean the word love, but I'm saying I don't know. Come up with a better word, Anjali. Who is to to accept each other, to to respect each other? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody who hears this conversation will definitely ask <laughs> to help. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you should be flirting with the right side of you. I mean, it's it's the most ridiculous statement anybody can hear, but it's true. Okay. So it's, that in that in that case, then when the Shiv and the Shakti are within you, the marriage is within you. So uh, whether you're married uh, physically, it really doesn't matter. Anjali, it 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 is also a manifestation of the inside into the outside part. Right, uh, the husband that a woman marries has that you know intensity of Shiv Tattva. the the woman that a man marries has the intensity of the shakti tattva so it does help to have that thing but it does not make you a lesser mortal if you're not married and that's what aghor vidya also says aghori is as as you know single mukhi shiv not the tantra that they talk about when they talk about aghori they talk about tantric stuff and all that aghori the people they have very little social cultural graces uh they they have an immense amount of power and uh, uh i have had the honor of having uh, had three or four uh, uh, you know acquaintance uh, meetings with the head augur you know uh, who is also form of shiv but he's that form of shiv that i'm talking about the the left and the right are are the uh, male and the female part of that form of shiv So yes, uh, if you're not married, it doesn't mean uh, that you're a lesser mortal. Uh, again, you know, one or two small things that I have noted down that I think I should share is uh, when when you sleep, uh, husband and wife sleep together, whether husband and wife, their partner, or whatever they are, uh, the male uh, member or the male uh, sort of acting member should be sleeping on the right side. and that's the form where shiv is and the 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 female uh, or the feminine form of member should uh, sleep on the left side and uh, except during uh, you know the diwali and shivratri period when they switch sides so uh, this is just one thing that might help us you know, it also helps to reduce clashes of energies that happen without people knowing why they happen then there is an electromagnetic posturing for example uh if if you're sitting down with your right leg crossing your left leg it has a different electromagnetic uh charge is not the right word i don't have a better word uh and if your left leg is over your right leg then uh, there's a different uh, configuration of that energy it's a different electromagnetic posturing and that has its own dif- definite like the left nostril and right nostril even this has their own values like for example uh 
if I am sitting down and uh, I have my right leg over my left leg, it is uh, it is a different uh, sort of uh, mindset, mood set, aura set. But if I want to use power, uh, then I will put my left leg over my right leg, and that I will be uh, I will then be in the shakti pose, and then I can use my energy positively or negatively more effectively. Right. Then one more thing that I have noted, which I, I don't think as a point it will make. Uh, how to appease each other's energy, for example. See, husband and wife are always fighting. We didn't make this food well. This is our daughter. This is not this. Our daughter is not doing all right. You're not spending enough time. All that kind of thing will carry on and on. It has carried on from the even before Ram, it carried on. And I don't think it will ever end. So, uh, so then how do you deal with each other? How do you appease the energy of your husband or your wife? Because your physical body will be clashing about the stupidest thing, the mango and the this. I mean, all kinds of pure superficial rubbish is the reason for arguments between husband and wife. Ask me, ask my wife. My wife will never tell you the truth. So she'll say, no, no, my husband is like this and very nice and all that kind of stuff. I think she's mugged up all these things. It makes her sound very lucky and happy. But the truth is, I'm not a great husband. And... Uh, then how do I deal with that? And how should she deal with me? We need to look at each other, not only as physical beings, but also as spirit beings. Right. The form of your husband or your wife is not the form you see. You might have a husband who's very nice, who's a little lackadaisical, who's a little must and not very conscientious, very boring guy, doesn't do anything right. But his form may be wonderful. He might have cultural, you know, uh, uh, accents of saying the right thing at the right time to the right person, making the right, all that nonsense he may not have. Not nonsense, that's actually a lot of sense. But he may not have those, those that sense. But then, how do you deal with a guy who irritates you? Allow yourself to deal with his spirit, which is completely different mind than his physical mind. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to convince you. I do Very this. When I'm in trouble with my wife, I've seen her real form. Gurudev showed it to me. I've never told her about it because I'm not stupid. Uh, why would I tell somebody about the powerful base that they have? I'd rather they remain lost in this world and easier to manipulate, right? So, but how do I deal with her? I then look at that form of her and I say, yeah, can you please help out? And normally that helps. Try it. Right. I think most of the points we have covered, Anjali. Yes, we have. And there are a few questions here as well. But I think what I can request is most of the questions are answered. But if there are some, uh, you could please, audience, you could write to us at hingori.sutras at gmail.com and we would answer them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I think we've covered most of them. We have a couple of more points, but uh, uh, it's up to you. We can keep that for another day. We've done chakras before. We've, we've spoken about that at length too. But the, if there is just, if we could end with one question, uh, which is sort of connected to r realization, where you know, spirituality, we consider it to be as a, a way of life in its true sense and in some form of a final equation. Can it give us freedom from everything, including spirituality itself? Repeat the question, please. Spir spirituality is considered a way of life. In its true sense, in some form of a final equation, 
can it give us freedom from everything including spirituality itself it's a brilliant question whoever has framed it devraj very brilliant question so the the concept is very simple we live within circles in the circle of maya spirituality is the final destination but when you cross that spiritual maya or when you cross that circle of maya nothing is and everything isn't i mean that's a fabulous way to describe uh, reality now if you look at this one sentence nothing is matlab what is is actually nothing and everything isn't which means everything that you see feel sense actually isn't there it's a projection of the mind so there is no reality to reality similarly when you reach a particular level of spirituality you come to the point that there is nothing to be gained there is nothing to be attained there is nothing to be acquired there is nothing that belongs or nothing that you need it to belong to you realize your so so that is actually called the loss of ego you suddenly realize that your ego is actually just an acquired uh, it's an acquired disease and it is mainly uh, instigated by the existence of the mind so that is why devraj's question is amazing because at a particular point of time you have to stop even wanting to be spiritual because the truth is you already are all this time that we are trying to practice spirituality is because we don't know that we are spiritual the day we understand that we are then what are you going to do does that answer the question yes it does yes it does and with this uh, you did recite a quote this morning the guru vashisht you know it's a nice quote actually i'll read it out to you. it's already there it says right. ahit yashochit tat bhram sanatanam chaitanya rahit yashochit swayam kalo no kal no chite i mean my sanskrit is pretty good i got 5 marks out of 100 every year so uh, you're going to ask me to translate this god help you but what it means is consciousness without the mind is brahma is supreme consciousness it is supreme consciousness overridden by the mind that becomes the thought of itself so the thought of itself is ego i am and everything about the i am the me the mine the yours the not so mine all this is because consciousness gets attached to the mind which colors it which taints it which uh, infects it and gives it the disease of i am right i think we have taken a lot of time and really it should be time to say yes. good night yes thank you very much for the session it's 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 been a lot of food for thought here for of us and a lot of practice as well to do and thank you dear audience and if there are some questions if they've not been answered we request you to please write in to hingori.sutras@gmail.com yes and we would answer those for sure and with this good night shubhratri shabakas see